Hello, everybody. Welcome to Astrology Unplugged. I am Rick D. Clementi, and this is StarSelf.com coming to you from the Pittsburgh area. Tonight's a very special night where I'll be reading a friend named Tim, his chart. And I picked this chart out specifically for a certain reason. Um, in the coming weeks, we're going to try to get, uh, once I can give you more testimonials on my Healy, my Healy device. There it is. We're going to get Linda Veros talking about the Healy device. And it works in sync with the iPhone. And you put it on your body or you put it on wrist attachments and it sends all these vibrations through you according to what you want to deal with. And it's just outstanding. It's going all over the world like crazy now. Called Healy. Anyhow, we're going to get into it. I'm Marsha Bud. I want to do Tim's chart, and I'm going to show you why right off the bat. Remember, I'm here to primarily teach astrology. Secondarily, I help certain people if I can. But the main thing is about teaching astrology. Okay, so here we go. This is Tim's chart. Tim is, um, I believe, currently in Ohio. So you notice Tim is 1980. Remember, last week I taught you about the four angles. So we see the sun is on the angle, even though it's four degrees shy, three degrees shy. The Jupiter is too far from the angle. This is not an angular Jupiter. It's eight degrees away. The Uranus is certainly very powerful. This is the most powerful planet in the chart because it's so close to the ascendant. Okay? So he's very Aquarian. I should say this properly. He's a Pisces, but he's very Uranian. Being Uranian is not quite the same as being Aquarian, but they're similar. Okay? He's very Uranian. And that Uranus is in Scorpio. That's a very powerful place for Uranus. His moon is in Leo. Mars and Jupiter and Virgo with Saturn. There's three Saturn planets in the Saturn midheaven. He's got the Chiron over in Taurus. He's got the Venus next to brand new Eris in Aries. The Mercury is retrograde when he's born. And one of the things you could do, I'm going to talk about that for a second. When you're born with a retrograde, what I would do if he were in my office, I would move that planet from that day forward and backward, and let's say age 10 or age 12, his Mercury came out of retrograde or 10 days after his birth. Well, oftentimes what you do find with a child, sometimes retrograde children have trouble speaking or they have a lot to say and they just don't want to talk or they have speech problems or whatever. Sometimes it's nothing. But all of a sudden that Mercury turns around and goes forward and they start talking. For example, my brother was, he was Mars retrograde. And when you look 16 days after his birth, Mars turned forward by progression. 16 days after, he's born February 22nd. So we go eight days into March, eight days more to get out of February, eight days into March. So around the eighth day of March, his Mars turned forward. And at age 16, heretofore, he had been staying in his room, very quiet, Pisces, very shy. He got in touch with his testosterone, his maleness. And he started lifting weights, and he went out for the football team. So this is a perfect example of a Mars turning direct. Well, Tim's Mercury went direct at some point, which I'm not going to get into now. And that reminds me of the recent book by Arroyo. You see, there's one, there's several really big advantages to doing charts like Liza and I, I did, us people in our 80s, see? When you do them by hand, you can sense how fast they're moving. Because you're looking at a page where you see all the planets and you can tell when it retrogrades, when it's going fast, when it's going slow. When you look at a chart like this, you can't tell. It's just up there on the screen. So Royo puts a lot of stress in his final book 
that planets that are moving slower are more powerful. Makes sense. Like this threatening thing outside that's hovering by your window, but it's not going by real fast. It's just hanging out by your window. It's pretty threatening. So really what we should be doing as we put these planets up, we should be referring to our ephemerides to see if that planet was moving fast, was it slowing down? Of course, planets slow down when they're approaching retrograde or they're approaching going direct, that's what. Anyhow, I'll get off of that, but that I wanted to throw in for the record. Hi, Dr. John. Good to see you on your, your uh, Gilligan's Island there. Okay, now, here's the whole point I'm getting to tonight. And I asked him if he would volunteer to come on and he's been very gracious and I'm very excited because this is a complex story. Okay, first of all, you've got a Pisces. All right, now I'm gonna tell you right away. When you look at a sun sign, you know a lot already. Pisces is a weak sign. And I don't mean weak willed and I don't mean they can't lift weights, I mean, it's overwhelmed by the other things in the chart. Because it's not a strong statement like Scorpio or Leo or Aries. So it's easily overwhelmed by other stuff in the chart. But when you dig and dig and dig and get to know the person, you'll see the Pisces is there. I know what to look for. Because you dig down deep and there's nothing there. That's what happens with Pisces. You go inside and there ain't nobody home. You ever been around a Pisces and you go in there, hey, where are you? And that's because they're everywhere. It's a big statement. Remember that book I wrote, we wrote, was called Pisces, the ultimate sign. And it's because the 11 signs are ego-based, strengthening the ego until you get to the final stage of the 12th, where it gives up the ego and it becomes everything. That's why when you reach inside of Pisces, you're trying to grab the water. Where are they? They're everywhere. That's what I mean by big. So whatever sun sign you start out with, you're automatically looking for other symbols to help you out. Whether it's a Pisces, you need more strength. Whether it's an Aries, you need to calm them down a little bit. Whether it's a Taurus, you need to get them moving and not stasis. Whether it's Gemini and they're moving all the time, you're trying to get them to settle down. Everybody's born out of balance. And that's why you have to look to the rest of your chart to see. Now, when we take a look at Tim, we know his moon is in Leo. Okay, we know this already. He's a Pisces with a moon in Leo, and he's got Scorpio rising, and he's got Uranus right on the ascendant. Right away, we got four major statements. Now, the moon in Leo acts very different between the male and the female, just like the sun in Gemini. The sun in Gemini males are very friendly and talkative and fun, where the Gemini females are more likely to just give you a tongue lashing and tell you off. Very sharp tongues. Leos, Leo women are usually very, very pleasant. Shiny, they're pleasant. Leo males can be pretty darn arrogant. So I have found those two signs out of all 12 to have the most disparate nature when you look at the male and female. My opinion. I'll have to get the doctor to make me a disclaimer sign some night. It'll say, Rick means what he says, but don't hold him to it. <laughs> we'll try that one now. Okay. Now, before we go any further, we've got a Pisces with a moon and Leo. Now, right away, that's a good sign because the problem with Pisces is they bite off more than they can chew. They take this lifetime to be so Christ-like. Oh, you can walk on me. Oh, you can tell your secrets. I won't tell anybody. You guys go eat. I don't need to eat. I'll go back up on the cross. I don't mind me. You know, I'm out in the sun here for 12 days. I don't need any more water. You know, just don't mind me. They're very selfless and they're martyristic. So they need more ego. 
that's the conclusion to that book. So what better way to handle a male Pisces than to put a moon in Leo? So right off, you've got all your statements that you're typing. I don't have time to read, I'm sorry. Um, if you want to type to each other, that's just fine. Now, by looking at a Pisces sun and a Leo moon, by nature, we've got a pretty good balance to start with, but we don't know enough yet. And I'm going to tell you again. This is the third thing we're going to chisel on your forehead. Use a pencil. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Use a pencil. Use a pencil. You use a pen, you're going to have to erase it. All right, now, we got Scorpio rising. That gives intensity. You've already got an emotional Pisces. You now have an emotional sign like Scorpio rising, and you've got a moon, which is not emotional, but it's demonstrative. Tim, I don't know about you and people around you, but people with Leo planets, they have demonstrative, they have big hands moving, and they're dramatic. Now, let's go back to the chart. I have found myself to be more successful in this show recently when I go slower, and I think that's really good. Now, I told you, there's nothing angular. There's nothing angular here because it's 4 and 12. This is 8 degrees away. Sometimes solar fire draws things that look angular, but they're not when you examine the degree. 4 and 12. So these are clearly 9th house planets. If this Jupiter was over at 9, 10, it would be 9th house and 10th house. The 10th house, Saturn and Virgo, is very strong. It is angular, but it is 12 degrees away. Saturn and Virgo retrograde is symbolic of a drill sergeant. Now, when Saturn is retrograde, I always ask the client, was your father distant from you? Was he tough on you, etc." Now, when you find Saturn retrograde at an angle opposite the sun or whatever it is, you don't have to ask the question. This is an indication clearly that there was trouble with the father. Now, this does not mean that this was trouble with the father. It means that Tim saw it that way. And we're not taking sides, but in Tim's experience, his father was like a drill sergeant. He's always trying to please him up at the top of the chart. Virgo planets, you can't do anything right. I can't please the guy. Now, that does not mean it's true. That means that's how he saw it. And this usually ties to past lives. But the Saturn, is, the Saturn is angular, and it's in a tough place in Virgo, which is a critical place for it. Let's go back now. We're just putting more little items on with a pencil. This is a tough chart. It's not easy. All right. We see Pluto in the middle of the 11th house, and it's opposite Venus. 21, 21. Whoa! 21, 21. So Pluto is really having his way with Venus. And what does Pluto do in the natal chart? When it's opposite the moon, it's very complex. We don't know what the issue is, but there's always an emotional issue where you don't feel up to speed with other people's emotions. When Pluto's opposite Mercury, you like in the United States chart, you feel somewhat inferior mentally. You don't know why. Did somebody make you feel that way? Oftentimes, if you put your parents on such a pedestal, you'll feel stupid and there's nothing they did. You just feel that way by comparison. With this Pluto opposite Venus, what it means is there's something about Tim's upbringing where Tim feels or felt inadequate socially. Pluto opposite Venus. Whether he went to dances and just sat there, he didn't want to dance, whether he didn't go to the dance, we don't know yet, but do you see what I'm doing? I'm not going to try to dive in yet. I drew it in pencil. Let it go. It's too much for you to dive in all this stuff and come up with a mouthful and express how it is. It's just too much stuff. We know 
Sun is in Pisces. He's delicate. He's compassionate. Big soul. Scorpio is rising. He's intense. Uranus is rising by the ascendant, so he's a little bit wild. We know Pluto's opposite Venus, which is really confusing because on the one hand, it's a little bit stepping back socially. At the same time, it's like having Venus and Scorpio. So he's passionate. He's got the moon and Leo. He's dramatic. We see all these parts. So there's no way that you can start blending these parts till you put them on in pencil, till you dance around and you go around and around the chart. Because what will happen is you'll start to pick up sub-themes, sub-themes, and themes. And then you'll start to hear, boy, this theme's in here an awful lot of times. And that's when you go towards the pen instead of the pencil. So Pluto Venus has got something to do with socializing, usually what it means. Pluto oppositions are very tough. Usually what it means is he's taking his emotional relationships way too seriously, and he's moving too carefully instead of just being himself. But the, the real thing that stuck out there is they're both at 21. Not 21 and 27, they're both at 21. That guitar string is really tight. And so when a transiting planet gets 21, 21, 21, 21 hits that guitar string, kaboing, things will happen. Keep that in mind. You guys are definitely going to, tune, going to want to tune in about two weeks from now because I'm going to do an episode called Keeping Astrology Simple. <laughs> I think, I think you're going to want to be there because I want to hear it myself. <laughs> Keeping astrology simple. But I thought it was time for that after 182 sessions. Okay. That ought to be a good. I think, I think when I do keep astrology simple, I'll just turn on Waldo's microphone. <laughs> and uh, Waldo, how do you make that one simple? <laughs> and he'll tell us. Anyhow. Welcome to all your YouTubers with us. I'm real glad you're with us. Uh, okay, so now we see Saturn at 24, almost 25, opposite Mercury. This is the story of the evening. We're going to get into this. What does Mercury and Pisces retrograde think when it's opposite Saturn retrograde? Mercury and Pisces down in the little fourth house where it gets his feeling church opposite this monolithic Saturn and Virgo, retrograde, angular. Mercury's opposite Saturn. What it means is, whether this is past life, whether this is actual or not, I would investigate this by looking in the past lives, but it makes him feel inferior mentally. Now, what Arroyo's taught, because Arroyo's brilliant, what actually might happen with him is he might actually appear to people to be superior mentally, overreacting to it. So when you got a strong statement, always be aware that the client might flip it on a fear and be the opposite. Like, oh, Moon and Leo, they're really proud. Moon and Leo, they say what's on their mind. You'll see some Moon and Leos, they won't even talk, they're so shy. They're going the other opposite way. And that's what's so good about reading and studying the royal. Okay, we don't know what this is, but we know that when Tim started to develop his mind, and I'll tell you right now, this is one of the most important evenings of his life, because this Saturn Mercury is not only exact with Neptune right now, but it's on the internet. Do you see? I don't pick these evenings, it just happens. So we're going to learn a lot about that Saturn and Virgo. And what do you think? This is why, this is why astro drama is so important. I asked my clients, uh, my, my students when I taught, come in the room and tell me what Saturn and Virgo would say. Come in the room and tell me what Mars and Pisces would say. And they think it's silly and it's awkward. But that's how you learn. You dramatize these planets. Well, what do you think Saturn says in Virgo? Why, well, you didn't do that damn job right. I got to come back and this job not done. And boy, in my day, we did this in the Marines. I'm doing right, 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 right. That's what it says. 
That's what Saturn Virgo is. Now we could beat ourselves up trying to figure how it got there, but it doesn't matter, it's there. It's a target tonight. Saturn and Virgo is the one who's going to lose tonight at the end of the evening, because Neptune's opposite. That's what the discussion's about tonight. Okay, so we know we got an issue with Saturn and Mercury. We got an issue with Pluto opposite Venus. We don't know quite what Uranus is doing on the Ascendant, because it's really pretty wild. All right. Now, the Sun, which is angular, it's really nine degrees, so it's only three degrees from that nadir, is a third house and fourth house. This gives him lunar qualities, not Cancerian, lunar. So it's very Cancerian, sort of, but it means this Pisces side of him loves to be at home, loves the family, loves the family tradition. And you notice here, I'm not looking at Tim. I don't really care what Tim thinks yet. I'm telling you exactly what the chart says. And we'll get to Tim's reactions later. But this is a person who loves the mom, loves the family, loves the traditions, a matter of fact, tradition and land and property and grandma's house and all that's a real big deal to this kid. Well, this sun is at nine and right opposite are two planets at four. And look where they're at. They're both retrograde, including Mars, which is very rare. They're both in Virgo. So the Pisces sun says, well, I want to bring my friends over and we want to have a nice little a hamburger roast and we're going to have some nice music on and uh, Jimmy's been overseas and we're welcoming him back and it's nice to see Jimmy. We're going to have some nice music and the Virgo stuff's up there going, ah, 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 what are you going to drop all that and get back to painting that fence like you said you're going to. That's what Virgo's about. And so he wanted to chill, to sign at once to chill as Pisces. You ain't chilling. We got stuff to do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. But I'm going to chill. Well, I'm not sure what to say. So this is a very natural argument in this chart. And this is why you dramatize it. Now, I'm going to ask Tim now. Is he around? I don't know. Yeah, Tim. Yep. Yep. Does this make any sense yet? Um... Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think, uh, yeah, maybe little, little pieces. All right. That's all we need for right now is little pieces. Thank you. We'll come back to you. All right. Notice the elongated face on Tim. Okay. People with long faces have Sagittarius or Aquarius. He's getting that from the Uranus in the, on the Ascendant. Aquarian people have very parallel faces and rounded chins, very similar to Sagittarius who have elongated face like John Kerry, very good example. Now, I'm not trying to hit him perfectly yet, I'm just drawing on pencil. But we're seeing what's so interesting about Tim's chart. Tim's chart has really two different themes. Now watch this. Okay, on the gentle side, he's got the sun in Pisces, he's got the Mercury in Pisces, he's got um, the Neptune rising in the first house, he's got a T-square to Neptune. See this T-square? Saturn opposite Mercury squares Neptune. These are three very passive, lovely, kind-hearted mess symbols. Mercury, sun, Neptune. Now on the other side, the fiery side, he's got the Mars, the Jupiter, the Saturn, all up in hardworking Virgo. Well, what does Virgo want to do? I don't care. I'm going to let my work speak for itself. Say what you want. I'm not saying nothing. My work's going to speak for itself. Come and see what I'm building. Come and see what I'm making. Come and see what I'm shining. Whatever. My work will be so damn good, it will blow you out of your mind. That's what Virgos do. He's got a moon in Leo. It's not going to back down. He's got a real strong Pluto that's speaking its mind right to Venus. He's got Eris right next to Venus. So you see, in the chart, there are just these 
apparently competitive themes. But if you're not careful, you'll see that in more competition that's really there. So, now Neptune comes in. We know we've got a passive kind person, but see with Moon and Leo, you never know. You never know about the males. This is it gonna bring out the kindness in you, the warmth that's in you, that magnanimous nature, or is it gonna bring out the Mussolini? Okay? You don't know. Now I'm telling you now from experience, this is a gift to him tonight. And it ain't from me, it's from himself because he's been doing good work. This is a gift that he's doing this. And at the moment we've been talking, there was no jackhammer, okay? The jackhammer is really symbolic of, I don't wanna hear what he's gotta say. He's really getting near my tender points, but I do. But I don't, but I do, but I don't. I learned this a couple of ways, but one way is uh, Neptune is on Tim's Mercury today. Oh, what a shock. Okay, Neptune doesn't always hit perfectly. That's usually Uranus. The fact that it's on there exactly means this is what this discussion's about. Now, long story short, I'm reading for a girl 10 years ago in my office. And I've been reading for eight times and I'm stuck, I'm not getting anywhere. And the reason I'm stuck, I finally figured out, is I'm not gonna go to where the ego is because I think your problem is the ego. And you don't usually go there with clients because that's very sensitive. So I said to her, you know, I just have to, have to say this and see, tell me how you feel because we're pretty good friends. I think your ego is involved here. The second, and it's always the second, the split second that I said that word, a damn vacuum cleaner went on up against my door. Hold the door. So I knew I had paid her. And what's interesting, this was three o'clock, and the lady that does the vacuuming always comes at seven. So I knew for sure. And then a few minutes later, she turned her vacuum off. But what that is, that is not a vacuum cleaner. You are hitting the spot and the inner self is screaming. Don't go there. I don't want to talk about this. That's how the ego defends itself. But then she did want to go there, but she didn't, but she did. But what's interesting now, six, seven years later, I haven't seen her since. Okay, so the ego won. The ego won. Okay, now, a lot of times when the ego is defending something, we don't know why, and it's, it's one of the jobs of the ego to protect us. So it's a real good thing. The ego is not always trash. It's protecting us, it doesn't know why, but it's just, you know, if I put a jackhammer, I won't be able to hear what he says. Now, I challenge you, do all your work and report back to me in 600 years when you go to somebody's house that has a jackhammer going on. <laughs> so we know it's rather unusual. Now, here's a story that I'm really getting to. Neptune is going over him right now. Neptune is going over his Mercury right now. And it has been accustomed to this perennial fight with Saturn. Now, Neptune is down here in the fourth house and Saturn's up here. Now, what I want you to understand, and this is something to me, after 42 years, I'm finally learning this. This is not an energy out there. And I keep telling you, and this is really the truth, what got into Waldo? What's gotten into Doc? I don't know what's come over Linda lately. Erica, I don't know what's gotten into her. Okay, when we say those things, we're exactly accurate. And when we say, I don't know, we, we don't know because we don't know the planets. But they're the planets. And that's what's happening. And we know when it's going to hit, when it's going to peak, how long it's going to last, and how it's going to act. That's what astrologers do know. So, what is Neptune trying to do to his Mercury? 
his Mercury is already in Pisces. Okay, if it's retrograde or not, it's trying to paint that Mercury in a, in an even truer Piscean sense. Mercury in Pisces is not a, it's one of the weak spots for Mercury because Mercury is dignified over in Virgo. Mercury is trying to tell him, quit thinking of the world in black and white. Quit thinking of the world in yes and no terms. Quit thinking of the world as a rigid place where you got to do this and you got to do this, do this. Go do your art. Go float on an inner tube. Go out to the lake. Just relax and chill, and that's okay. That's what Mercury's trying to tell him. And that's what the Pisces in him is longing to hear. The Pisces, as I said, doesn't have a lot of chance up against all this Virgo pressure and even the Uranus pressure on the Ascendant. But the Neptune is here, it's not up here. It's not up on the Saturn, it's down here, opposite the Saturn. So, what the Neptune is doing, Neptune is coming out of him. It's coming out. Neptune is loud, it's very subtle, it's really actually very quiet, and it's real easy to miss this. Now, when I saw his moon in Leo, and I was talking about his chart the other day, I didn't know if he would sense this Neptune or not, because Neptune's very quiet, very subtle like a cloud. We don't know if that moon in Leo is so strong and fiery whether you would even notice this. A lot of people would have this Neptune go by and nothing would happen. So the fact that he is, not only is he hearing it, but he's volunteering to be on the show to talk about it, shows to me that he has a very good susceptibility and he's open to his energy. What's Neptune trying to tell him? Neptune's trying to tell him, if you would just shush, I will give you what you need because I am God. Neptune is God's voice. That's what Neptune is. The reason I want you all oneness, all nothing matters, everything is inclusive, is because it's all that Neptune is Christ's voice. If I may say so. That's a complex story. All, all of the, uh, I've got a, I've got a mic, I've got a check here. Let's see what that is. Okay. All right. So what Neptune is trying to show him, and remember, his biz ruling planet is Neptune. He's a Pisces. You gotta, if you don't have this memorized, you really got to get this memorized before we have the class on things could be easier. You got to know what planet rules what sign. Neptune is just relax, everything's going to work out. Don't listen to this Virgo stuff. Fanatic on the Virgo and painting, everything's got to be measured just right. We don't want to use another board and have to cut it and measure it. And blah, 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 blah. Virgo, just get lost. Pisces knows where it's at. Now, I told you before, I'm laying on a blanket with my girlfriend in the summertime. We're underneath this big, beautiful tree. And I look up in the tree and there's this dead branch. And I told her, look, if I'm a Virgo, I can't sit here and relax and drink lemonade until I get up in that tree and get that branch out of there. <laughs> right? Like it's going to really matter. I said, if I'm Pisces, I go, yeah, with that branch. That's all part of nature. It'll decay when it decays. That's why in the book, this chapter, on the six polarities, the most important polarity in the zodiac is understanding Pisces and Virgo. Really critical, tells you everything. Because Virgo is about no and restriction and do this right and get this right and, and take it on the chin and don't say anything, get to work. And Pisces is just let it be. The dog's just taking a pee, leave him alone. <laughs> just relax, let it be. But I told you where the problem comes in, and this is where we really have to express ourselves clearly here. 
when Virgo sees somebody relaxing, it's really akin to somebody being a bum. And Virgos can't stand bums. Get your ass to work. But is the person laying back on that chair, what if it's the Pisces Einstein and he's an inch away from figuring out his big theory? A lot of productive things happen when you're laying back relaxing. So that's the problem with the Pisces Virgo axis. The Virgo has to be given permission to go relax. And the Pisces, on the other hand, has got it. They know about being laid back, but if they're not careful, they can become a bum and become too uh, meaningless. So they got to be in balance. The Virgo and the Pisces have to be in balance. Get up and work when you need to work. Relax when you got to relax. You got to be in balance. But in his chart, he's got four planets. He's got three planets in Virgo plus the Virgo midheaven, all opposite that little Mercury. And now Neptune's on the Mercury, exact. So while it's there, I'm speaking for it tonight. I'm instigating the beginning of this dialogue. Neptune's telling him, look, I know all these things in the world are important. Yes, you got to pay your rent and stuff, but it's going to work out. And don't let these worldly things get you upset. Because when you're in sync with me, Holy Spirit, when you're in sync with me, Holy Spirit, everything will work at all times. Always. And the Virgo's going, oh, that's a hell of an agreement, boy. Did you get that on paper? <laughs> See, but that's not how Pisces works. Pisces has the two biggest gifts in the zodiac. Faith and belief. They got it normally, naturally. Now we're ready to talk to Tim. If I can find him. Here he is. Hi, Tim. Okay, Tim, tell me what you're thinking so far and whether you want to punch me or something. Um, no, I'm enjoying this. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't really know much about, uh, this, this topic. And so, you know, the charts and everything is quite a bit over my head. You don't worry but, about the um, astrology part. Yeah. But, but when you're, I, I do think a lot of what you're saying makes sense or sounds uh, accurate with my experience. Um, uh, I, I do think I have like a lot of conflicting, overpowering um, inclinations towards towards things, and uh, sometimes that sometimes I resolve that by uh, just leaning on impulsivity and spontaneity, and then I don't that's have the, to. That's the Uranus rising. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So so then I don't have to uh, let those two fight out. That's my solution but that's a good thing that's a very good release for you yes mm -hmm. um, and you've got that t-square to neptune remember you have two planets opposite and they go to neptune and that means your release there is oh just let it be it'll be all right right now right. the difficult so, the difficult thing i was looking at in your chart earlier is you're going to have a tendency there's the backup you're going to have a tendency with the, I'm calling them four planets in Virgo, it's really three plus the mid heaven, and a moon in Leo, you're going to have a tendency to want your, here's the whole story, to want your well being to be related to how well you do your work. Mm -hmm. You're going to identify so much with the, what you're building, what you're making, that you're going to let it, the fear is that you're going to let it override who you really are, which is the Neptune part, which is the Pisces mm -hmm. part. Do you understand? Yeah. In other words, people are going to love you for who you are. They're going to love you for what you're making, love you for your skills and all that. But don't let that become primary. The primary mm -hmm. thing is, what I'm saying to you is, What's primary is your ability to love, your ability to be open, and more importantly, to let love in. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me like the person I'm talking to has a pretty good balance on this, and I think this is very nice. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't experience balance. <laughs> okay, well, with the Uranus on the Ascendant, you'll swing wildly. Yeah. 
you will definitely swing wildly. But when you pull back and look at this, I'll bet you, you know, before I came out of the picture last week, I'll bet you, you knew something's going on. You're in a sign of a kind of a turning point. Um, yeah, I mean, things are at a fever pitch for me. I, I don't know how much my mom discussed with you the, uh, my, my current life situation, but, uh, a little, a little bit. Yeah, but I, I, I bought a house that uh, needed to be completely redone all the way, including foundation and really everything. Um, I just and, been through that myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, do, I don't have the experience or skills to, to do this stuff, but I've decided to do as much of it as I can and basically been working on it every day for the past three months and now uh, do you want to know what neptune's telling you right now to knock it off <laughs> huh. quit trying to do it by yourself yeah 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 i shout out and say look i'm up to my elbows and believe me we've been through this for three four years we know and the, the, the cost i could use some help here and you've told me that before I ask, you're already supplying what I need, and you're built with trust and faith. Mm -hmm. See, if you listen to that Virgo stuff, it's not trust and faith. Damn it, I'll see it when it's when the guy signs on the line. That's what I'll see. It. That's what I'll see. It. But the Pisces isn't that way. Pisces, I do trust. I do trust mm -hmm. somebody will show up and show me. I'll see a web page that tells me how to do this. It'll work out. Some astrologer out of Pittsburgh will do my chart all over the world. <laughs> how about that one? So what Neptune is trying to do with you, because it's going to go back and forth over that Mercury for a whole year. It's not nothing in a hurry. It's going to be going back and forth all over it. Mm -hmm. Neptune is trying to tell you to have faith, it will work out. And you got a liar in you. And I don't mean that personally, we all got it. You got a liar in you. The Virgo and the Leo are gonna lie to you. Because they're gonna say, well, you have to know how to do it. And you should be able to do this. And this is a Tim thing. And it's all coming from Tim, it's a liar. Because it's not. Because everything comes, everything is downloaded as you know. So this is, in a way of speaking, this is your chance out of many decades to really download your, your grace and your intuitive um, skills. And it would be very easy in your chart. This is not critical at all. It'd be very in your, easy in your chart to have these more subtle forces just covered over. The T squared to Neptune, the Mercury down in Pisces, the Sun in Pisces, they could get layered over very easily by these more forceful outer planets. So what this is saying is, okay, when you start to sweat, when you start to get worried, when you start to push too hard, stop. Tell your sentry, nyeh. <laughs> Tell your drill sergeant, nyeh. Goodbye. You're not in charge of me. I am a God's son, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to go chill. I'm going to take a walk, and it's going to be all right. Because how many times, all of you, how many times have you seen people that are worked to death and they're haggard? And they, get, they look like they have no faith in anything. Nothing. Except more medical bills. There's nothing fluid about them. Nothing fluid. And astrologically, being fluid is the most important quality you can have. Because you're keeping that channel open. Now, is this making sense to you? Mm -hmm. Good. Go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't we know. Got, I, I, we got the uh, aurora borealis behind Peter, and we got, we got the ocean breeze behind John. I got to get something good behind me. This is crazy. Go ahead. Is <laughs> Go ahead. 
Go ahead, Jim. Um, yeah, I just, uh, th there's, there's certain things that are uh, out of my control that I need to right. get better at letting go. And there are certain things in my control. And um, uh, right now, it, it's, it's very like smoky <laughs> figuring out which one was which. And uh, yeah, that's what Neptune does. It makes it very cloudy and confusing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that's the greatest source of stress um, uh, and, and challenge for me in, at this time is uh, knowing when to step back. You know, a lot of people are telling me I should take a day off of working on this house. And at the same time, um, I don't know, there's a finite amount of time. and. Uh, is that true? There's, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, I mean, yeah? I don't. I never knew there was a finite I, amount of time. <laughs> well, I go back to work in, in a few weeks. I'm a teacher, and I'm going to have a lot less time available to work at the house. Um, I don't know. I, guess, I mean, I guess what something the, could change what with that. Well, the question when you get into these jams, and they're very legitimate, what you're saying, is, mm. What does the faith say? What does the reason say? As opposed to what does the BS say and what does the dictator say? There are four mm. people involved here. And you don't want to hear from two of them. You want to hear from <laughs> what is really intuitive and what is really uh -huh. rational. Well, you don't yeah. want to hear from crazy talk. You know, I got a voodoo doctor. She's going to take care of everything for me, right? Mm. And you don't want to hear the dictator, because the dictator you'll never please. But what right. tonight is doing, in a major way, when Neptune is exactly on your Mercury, one day out of 164 years, on one day, it's exactly on you, because it's opening that channel. Now, Tim, what happened to me in the 70s, when Neptune hit my Mercury, because Mercury is your mind. It's the way your mind works. It's a computer. On that, I don't know if it was that day, it's close, but I was in meditation and I felt my mind completely open. Completely. And I didn't know that it could do that. I didn't know that there were rooms. It just completely opened. And it's never closed since. I take it for granted. Now, that same type of thing is happening with you. With your Uranus there, let me show you. With your Uranus here, right here, this means you're really hardworking, you're very inventive, you're genius-like, you, you like to do things suddenly, get things done. This is very powerful, and it's very uh, ahead of its time. You're really smart, and they're very much into... Um, nature and uh, the environment especially this also jupiter mars this is somebody who gets 12 things done in one hour this is somebody who really gets things done very powerful this is really hard working okay but the problem with it is these three planets feed directly into the sun and the sun is your identity and we don't want your sun to be informed just by three Virgo planets. We want the sun to be informed by the Neptune that it is. Understand, Susan? So, it sounds to me like you're really on the right track. You're doing really well considering all the things hitting you at once here. <laughs> it is not easy. Yeah. I tell you what, you better be glad that Uranus is no closer. That would really be rough. Then you'd have like my chart. But um, all I'm saying to you is this won't be easy. This is time for you to start taking some time off now and then, even if it's a couple hours, and sitting by yourself, if it's reading or if it's meditating or whatever, taking a walk and starting to hear that quiet voice inside, starting to appreciate it and not let those damn drill sergeants in the room. If you let them in, they're just gonna come in with a jackhammer. <laughs> you get me? 
Mm -hmm. And there's a place for the jackhammer. And there's a place for building a house and renovating and all that. It's got its place. But it can't be too loud when it comes to how does Tim feel about himself. So I think this is really good. And I think it's a really marvelous symbol that you were open to getting past the jackhammers, open to sitting down with a bunch of strangers and hearing about this. Um, if I put you juxtaposed with all the other thousands of charts, your chart is not screwy. It's, it's a good chart. It has a couple stressful points that you have to work into balancing like most charts are, you know, but the thing that did concern me the most about the chart is, is that Neptune going to be hearable? Are you going to be able to hear it? Because Neptune's very subtle, very powerful, and very wise. And I'll bet you a lot of, I bet you if I talk to a lot of your friends, and I don't really know how much work you've been doing. I bet you some of the main adjectives your friends will use describing you is kind and mellow and laid back. Hmm. They're going <laughs> to sense. They're going to sense it. You're just sensing the fight that's going on with Uranus all the time. Hmm. But they see it. They see it. They see. They see that part. And what I'm trying to say is. Don't belittle how powerful this Neptune opportunity is. This is a very major lineup. It's kind of like your channel to God or, or to whatever spiritual leader you want. Your channel to it is getting bigger and broader. Hmm. Now, in your relationships, all your relationships, wife, dog, kids, bosses, everybody, in all your relationships, how do I put this? If you maintain, ah, this is so good. If you maintain that these drill sergeants really are right, and I really don't deserve to relax, then that's what the outer people are going to act like. Because yeah. there, there are no outer people. If you maintain that, boy, I have been working too hard. Boy, I have been too tough on myself. I deserve to relax and, and uh, uh, chill a little bit. Then the outer people will become that. See, we're all such, we're all so willing to become victims. You try to take the V out of somebody's hands. Uh-uh. People want to be a victim. They just, you ain't tell me I'm not a victim. And they want to give you a long list of how they're a victim. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, violence. And when you realize you're not a victim and that you're really in control of this, it goes away. Huh, Doc? Talk, hey, let me talk to the Doc for a second. Uh, I got you. You have to mute, unmute yourself. Okay. What, are you, what are you hearing, Doc? Yeah, that, that's it. I mean, it's surrender. I don't know what anything is for. I, everything I see has all the meaning that I give it for me. Bottom line. Right. Very good. Thank you. Now, Tim, what that means to me is I know you've got a good work ethic. That's not the issue here. The question here is, is the work ethic doable? Hmm. What, I, is, what is your opinion? I, well, I mean, that's, I think that's the nut of the problem is, is that I don't, I don't feel like I'm in a position to even consider if it's doable or not at this point. It's, it is, it's done and it's happening whether, whether I, you know, So you're telling ago, me that this river has already got its raging water. Yeah. Already yeah. going before you stepped in it. Right? Uh, well, uh maybe i don't know i i what i'm telling you is you're in charge of the river uh -huh. if you think you deserve a raging river with <laughs> no boats that's what you're going to get and if you think yeah. that you would like to have a river that's kind of cool and laid back you're going to get that too 
because I told mm -hmm. people on the show many times, the number one thing Pisces wants is to be left alone. Mm -hmm. Pisces want to lay back in that lake and relax and chill out. And, and all I'm saying to you is, you're always going to have these Virgo planets there. You're always mm -hmm. going to have the moon in Leo. You're always going to be a hard worker, et cetera, et cetera. That's always going to be there because it's too strongly stated. Mm -hmm. But you can start achieving more of a balance. Mm -hmm. You can turn it down when you want to turn it down. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Now, it's 9 o'clock. It's time for anybody that's got questions about that chart. Let's fire away with any questions about something like that or something related to you. But thank you so much, Tim. I, I really, I feel real good about this. And I know I do this every day. So I know what kind of odds you have with this and don't. And like I said, the Virgo is going to stay. And, you, and thank God you're going to be a hard worker. And you're not going to be in that list of Pisces who end up with uh, alcohol problems and listlessness. But we just mm -hmm. want to start getting a balance. That's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You are welcome. What do you think, Susan? Um, that Uranus on his ascendant has uh, cropped up in his relationships with colleagues, bosses, and whatnot many, many times. What does <laughs> it got, do? What does he's it got do? A, he's got a sense of humor that <laughs> um, he, he will say and do things that tickle him regardless of the reaction oh, oh, other people have true, and then he thinks that's funny too that so, is the urine. you're right there that is the so urine. yeah yeah so so quirky sense of humor for sure i th i think i've been trying to tell him um you know since we've talked that it's okay to let go a bit and to let others do some of this it, but I get it. He has sort of stepped into a moving windmill and the blades are right up against his nose. And it's hard to really get perspective when that's happening. I get that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's what, am I kind wrong? Of, that, that sounds kind of vicious to your nose. Well, yeah. You know. Well, the whole thing also is this. He has set in motion what he has now. Okay. Which right. means he is setting in motion now what he'll have later. Yes. Now let's take a look at what's going on in this chart. Okay? What if, I got a question though. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Is transiting Pluto having any particular impact here? That's exactly what I was going to look at. Pluto is right now about 24, about right here. And Eris is. By the way, everybody, I found out there's a new planet called Haumea, H-A-U-M-E-I-A, -E and she's exactly opposite Eris. Eris is a 24 of Aries. She's a 24 of Libra. How you like them apples? These two big, the new five planets that we just found, two of them are opposite each other, and they're both squaring <laughs> the Saturn and Pluto. If you... And she's the planet of um, fertility. So she's not a bad guy. Okay, now take a look at what you're seeing here, Susan. When Pluto's at 24 now, when Pluto was just recently at 21, look at what it was doing. It was squaring the Pluto Venus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the last two or three years, this Pluto-Venus opposition of his has been under the gun from Pluto-Saturn. So that's why you may not be aware of this, but if you slow down and look at it, this whole issue of how I socialize, how I've been taught to socialize, what has been my history of socializing, that's all been under question in the last couple of years. And I will guarantee you, in the last two years, he has changed how he socializes. Because what Pluto does when it transits, it makes you sick of relationships that aren't 50-50. Hmm. Does that make any sense, Tim? I can find him. Does that make any yes, sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay, what's, yeah. Hap what's happened there? 
Well, uh, I try to be less funny at, at work. And, uh, <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, so, sometimes I'm able to uh, think something before I say it. And, and those, those are also benefits. Okay, one of uh, Uranus transiting square natal moon. Okay, we'll get there, Walter. Thank you. Um, what, one of the things Pluto is doing, now remember, you've got Pluto opposite Venus, and Pluto's come now to square itself. So Pluto's one fourth of the way through its orbit, but it happens to be squaring the Pluto Venus axis. Okay. And Waldo keeps adding trouble to, to my work here. He keeps dumping <laughs> more bricks on my pallet here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll get the Chiron too. <laughs> okay, what Pluto on Venus is saying to you is this. I'm not sure what my issues have been in relationships. I'm not sure about what the answer to all this is, but I'm done with it. That's what Pluto says. I'm done with it. This is who I am, and you're going to have to deal with it or go to goodbye. That's what Pluto says when he gets in this kind of a, um, axis. Now, this is not how Pisces talks, but this is how Pisces talks when Pluto's on. So Pluto's, in other words, you're saying to the world, I'm good enough to relate to anybody when I relate socially and let it stand. And if you and if you aren't willing to go 50-50 with me, then I'm not willing to dance with you. That's what Pluto's saying. Now, Waldo's busy throwing more bricks on me while I'm talking, so let me see what I can find here. You said Uranus at 10 Taurus. Uranus is right on Chiron. Okay. And square to the moon. Oh, this is a big deal. This is a real big deal. Okay, now, this is really big. Uranus is sitting right here right now. In your lifetime, it's gone from here. It's gone over here, and it's sitting on Chiron. It's squaring the moon, and it just entered the sixth house. This is a big deal. Now, what this means is you're going to be very busy learning a new job skill now you're being very busy with this building but uranus going into the sixth house is about learning new computer skills so you should be huh. you should be under the gun right now learning all kind of web skills or internet skills or something can you tilt your camera down a little yeah does that make any sense to you yeah I, I think so. What does that mean? Um, wh uh, what does what you said mean to me? Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, so I guess with work, if, if we do virtual learning, I'll, I'll need to do a lot more on the computer than I, what I would do in person. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure beyond that what else. Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you further what it means. When Uranus enters the sixth house, it's right here now. It's going to be here about six years. Usually it's about seven, but this house is smaller. It's going to be here about six years. It's getting you prepared for when Uranus goes into the seventh. Because Uranus in the seventh is hello to the public, and I'm going to present a new image to people. I'm going to become a different persona. What Uranus is saying to you is I'm going to give you six years to learn a new skill set so it will come in handy when you pop out with this new Tim. Huh. That's okay. What this means. So this is not just computer skills. This can be all kind of stuff. But what we're seeing is you're about six years from presenting a new persona to the public and these new skill sets that you're learning in the next six years will promote that. Okay. So what do you teach? Uh, so I'm, I'm a special education teacher working at a career center. So I actually don't deliver instruction right now. 
Okay, that's very much in sync with all your Virgo planets, and all the Pisces planets. Yep. With the strong Chiron, it's very Piscean to help the underdog. So you're really in the right profession. Now, I do want to take a moment, which I don't usually do, but I want to <clears throat> take a moment and look in the past life. I just want to put in, he has a natural tendency since he was first able to walk and talk to be very compassionate and nurturing to other people. Always. That's very Piscean. Beautiful, wonderful. And that's one of the reasons he's getting supported tonight because we don't want the Virgo planets gobbling him up. Right. Turning him into just a, Virgos make your robots. If you don't watch the Virgo, it makes you a robot. You got to really watch it. I got a big smile out of Peggy because Peggy, Peggy got out of the jaws of the robot just in time. <laughs> Very good, Peggy. I'm glad. Now let's take a look at your past life chart and I'll tell you what I really call it. I really call it the, um, look at this chart. This is the spiritual transcript, in my opinion. Most astrologers don't even do harmonics. This is the 12th harmonic. This is a derivative of the birth chart. 12 is the number of Pisces. It's the number of your spiritual life. You multiply everything in the birth chart by 12, and you put it back on the circle. That's how you end up with Mercury and Pluto and Venus and Neptune and Sag. This is the chart of a spiritual teacher. This is the chart of a spiritual teacher who's been doing spiritual teaching for many, many lifetimes. Okay. That's what we know. Look at, look at Eris. Seeing right there on the angle. This is the area of the counselor. So what do we know about this? With all this Sag here, I think what this means is this. All right. Get ready for this one. I go back and forth. 12th harmonic natal chart. 12th harmonic natal chart. And I've learned to do that and I've taught myself that. And what that teaches me is before he took this lifetime in 1970, whatever, what did he think needed to be adjusted? I'm going to take another lifetime because when you're in between lives, you're not thinking about your family and the cul-de-sac and the garage. You're thinking about going back to God slowly, quickly. What do I got to do? Because you're out there in the ethers. So it's very clear to me. What did we see in his 12th harmonic? A bunch of Sag at the top of the chart teaching. Okay, Linda wants to try this. Do you want to try it? Try it, Linda. Unmute yourself. Tell me what you think. Why do, why do you think he came up with the birth chart he did, given the 12th harmonic that he had? Well, all, this, uh, all the Virgo planets are retrograde. And that suggests to me always that it's a period of uh, reflection on, on, uh, on what's gone before. And, so, and the Mercury is in retrograde. So that opposition is about, is really karmically about that balance it's not just about in the birth chart it's about how critical it is in this lifetime not to allow either one of those impulses those voices those that energy to to predominate well you're ex you're exactly where i was tonight when i started this but i'm seeing something in addition i'm not negating what you're saying i think what you're saying is true but the story i'm seeing is a little different there's too much cavalierness. All the sag at the top of the chart. I'm going to teach, but hey, we we'll just do it this way. I'm going to teach, hey, we we'll just do it that way. Well, what's the opposite of being cavalier? Virgo. Virgo. Okay? So that's why you took this lifetime and said, we're not going to be cavalier this time. Man, yeah, we'll put Uranus on the ascendant. Okay, but this time we're going to be more careful. We're going to put Saturn in the middle of all this, put Saturn in Virgo, but we're not going to be so cavalier because what happened is coming out of the last lifetime into this lifetime, it doesn't matter if he's right or not. He felt that he was being too cavalier. 
Maybe his spirit guide said that too. I don't know. So he puts in a couple of drill sergeants, like salt and pepper. Put in a couple of little sensors in there in this lifetime. And so what this means is in this lifetime, you're a little more careful about what you do and your mother just raised her hand. So you can unmute yourself and... I was just pointing out that I'm probably one of the drill sergeants. I don't <laughs> think so. You're one of the sages. <laughs> I don't think you're drill sarge. But what? remember, this is what matters here. What matters here is this is how he felt at the time that he arranged the roles that these people are going to play in his lifetime. Right. And when I saw the sads there, I saw it made total sense because this is the opposite of all that Virgo. Yeah. So, so what we're really seeing in conjunction with what Linda said is exactly right, is getting these things balanced. Getting these things balanced. And I'm going to tell you, Tim, one more time. You're really lucky that that Uranus is not closer to that ascendant. Because it's wild when it's really close. So I think it's a very intriguing chart to have witnessed. Making any sense to you all watching? Who's got a question? I got to compete with Aurora Borealis now. Look, I got the waving palms. I got the aurora borealis. I got a, I got a fire. That make me look like I'm in hell. I don't want to put a fireplace up there. I got to come up with something good. Maybe working gears or a clock or something. I don't know. Come on, who's got questions? We'll let the we'll let the YouTubers go for now. Thank you for being patient, Mr. And Mrs. YouTubers, and sticking with us. If you want to join us live, just go to Google and type in Astrology Unplugged. If you are 8 o'clock, Thursday nights, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, every week, type in Astrology Unplugged. It will give you the link to Zoom because the whole world is busy Zooming. Yep. We'll see you next week, and thank you for being with us.